Hello, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're joining us from. Nice to see you all here. Um, and for those of you that we got to see in person yesterday, nice to see you again. Um, if you won't mind, while everyone is gradually joining in this space, I'll ask if you could introduce yourself in the chat. Um, if you could just state your name, your organization, and where you're joining from, um, that would be great. And if you want to add any sort of fun facts about edge technologies or anything like that to feel free, go ahead. Otherwise you can keep it to just your name or again, where you're joining from. Perfect. Perfect. For those of you just joining us, uh, good morning or good afternoon or good evening from wherever you are in the world. Um, if you wouldn't mind just taking a second to introduce yourself in the chat, um, you can put your name, your org and wherever you're joining from. Um, and yeah, we look forward to leading the session with you all. And we'll start in maybe just a minute or so. We'll give it some time for, for folks to gradually come into the room. I was going to say we have a huge contingency from DC, but now we got something different in the chat. We've got <laughs> someone from Cape Town. <laughs> oh, with from Palindrome. So I don't know, Mira, if you even know that person joining in the room. That's great. Woohoo! Amazing. Cape Town too. Okay. Maybe just. Uh, 30 more seconds for those of you and feel free again to put your name in um, where you're joining from any organization that you're coming from or joining with. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, perfect. Okay. Um, so as you all um, get in, um, joined into the room and into the space, we'll go ahead and I think we can get started now just for the sake of time. And hopefully as people enter, they'll just be joining from the beginning so they won't miss anything. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. My name is Arielle and I am the Director of Public Health at Tech Change. Uh, so I'm excited to have you here in this space. Um, my background in coming into this conversation today comes from the perspective of having both implemented some digital health interventions sort of on the ground in a variety of different settings, but also um, most recently leading a, uh, a course with Merrick on the call here with the WHO with USAID um, on uh, digital health planning national systems. So really primarily targeting those who are national planners and building the capacity to think with more of what we have termed the enterprise planning approach for really a health systems perspective when it comes to planning for digital health interventions in a country at a national scale. And so I'm excited to be in the room with all of you and introduce you to our wonderful speakers here. And we're going to be hopefully doing a little bit more of an interactive session. So we will also be getting the chance to hear from all of you. So I hope you feel prepared to not just maybe share in the chat, but maybe even go off mute and share with us verbally some of your own perspectives on edge technologies. Um, we'll start with, we have a couple of introductions here. Everyone is on video. Um, we're gonna go from Merrick to Joy to Amira to try more. So pass it first to Merrick. All right, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Merrick Schaefer. I'm a senior digital health advisor at USAID and I work currently in the Global Health Bureau. Um, I've been in the international development space, uh, trying to make technology create impact for about 15 years now. I've worked at the UN, I've worked at um, uh, the World Bank, and uh, I spent the last nine years at USAID, um, first in the Global Development Lab, where I helped uh, establish the Development Informatics team, and now in the Global Health Bureau. Uh, I've spent a lot of time um, and uh, uh, working with technology. I was a software developer in the private sector for 10 years prior to, to coming into international development. Um, and I have uh, failed a lot. Um, and uh, through those failures, I've learned a lot. 
Um, though there's always more to learn. So I'm excited today to hopefully get some real engagement with everyone. Um, uh, and I want to hear uh, other people's uh, both successes and failures. And I want people to challenge what we say. All right, I pass it to, I think it was Joy. Yeah, thanks, Merrick. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. My name is Joy Kamunyori. I am a senior health information systems advisor with um, USAID's Office of HIV AIDS and the Global Health Bureau. Um, I come into this conversation with about 14 years of experience um, implementing digital health initiatives in various sub-Saharan um, countries. I've been at USAID for about two years. Before that, um, I worked for various implementing partners, um, uh, implementing digital health um, work. Um, I, like Merrick, I have a background in software development, although I never actually worked as a software developer. I have a master's in computer science um, as my background, and I'm also a project management professional. Um, so I am a huge proponent of technology um, for, uh, you know, to help solve some of the challenges we see in global health. However, I grew up in Kenya, and I also have a very strong practical streak about um, the context in which we work. So while I feel strongly that we should be using technology to improve our work, um, I um, also feel that we need to be implementing solutions that make sense in the context in which we work and make sense for the people we work with. Um, we hear too many stories of great ideas, fancy ideas um, that fail and fall by the wayside after implementation due to infrastructure, due to the capacity of the people that we're expecting to use these technologies, due to bad design and for you know, a variety of reasons. And I do believe that we sometimes do ourselves a disservice by failing to fully acknowledge the challenges we face in the interests of trying to do, you know, stuff that's innovative and interesting and exciting. Um, and I, so I think it's very important to keep in mind the context in which we work, not just in the cities that we um, that we that we primarily visit, but also in the rural areas of the countries that we work in, because the context can be very different um, in in those in in those um, cases. So I'm really interested in. Um, figuring out how to thread the needle between innovating and leveraging technology to improve um, global health work, um, but you know, doing it in ways that make sense and that are sustainable um, for our contexts. Thank you. I will now pass it on to Amira. I can't remember who was coming after me, thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Joy. Hi, everyone. My name is Amira Soldoker. I am the Partnerships Development Man Manager at Palindrome Data. We're a South African data science um, company that has been building predictive models in the HIV space, um, but actually leveraged all of these techniques from the private sector. Both of our founders have worked across the impact space and the private sector um, on uh, modeling and technology and so they're now looking we're now looking at applying this in the social impact space specifically in HIV. Um, I have come from a background of medicine myself uh, started off in the medical field and uh, developed apps for me and my colleagues to learn anatomy and physiology and then subsequently switched over to developing um, apps uh, on a larger scale for um, the healthcare system and environment in South Africa. So I have spent the last eight years in the digital health space um, from the development side to implementation uh, to strategy and capacity building. I'm a big pro problem solver, so I'm very keen on working with a, div a, div a diverse group of individuals to understand the various contexts and challenges around implementation and look at ways around uh, look at ways of solving these or overcoming these. Um, I do I do enjoy that innovation is um, really creative and it brings a lot of change and so dealing with this change uh, is something that i'm passionate about working with communities and stakeholders with overcoming 
Um, and I'm keen to share my insights on some of the data science innovations Palindrome have been working on. Um, and we'll, we'll definitely talk about both the merits and the demerits of these so that you have both sides of the coin when trying to evaluate these for your own context. Thank you. I will hand over to Trimor. Thank you very much, Amira, and welcome, everyone. My name is Trimo Chaurura. I come from a country called Zimbabwe. Um, my digital health journey has actually uh, it started about 17 years ago, where I graduated from uni and straight away I went into the banking sector, the payments industry. And um, as I matured, I looked for something to do, which was like philanthropic, to help humanity, to help development, Aside from just being a techie and being, you know, uh, bookish, uh, that's when I joined government in the capacity of the deputy director responsible for digital health for the entire Ministry of Health and Child Care in Zimbabwe. Um, some of my achievements include um, working with uh, donor organizations like uh, USAID, the Global Fund, etc., to bring connectivity to uh, communities in Africa or in Zimbabwe to make sure that um, the interventions that are being done elsewhere can be known elsewhere, it can be replicated uh, so that we take less time that it took other nations to digitize and to make use of the data that we generate. Um, my other achievement is actually then linking up um, these facilities with uh, electronic systems. We began with the HIV, obviously, of HIV, TB and malaria. And then the whole domain of uh, you know uh, health uh, healthcare uh, uh, diseases, until up to now where we are actually looking at a way we can um, tell a story of um, how best to implement digital health in a in a setup uh, such as ours, which is um, a developing nation um, or at least developed country, uh, taking it upwards, taking leaps uh, using technology. So um, yeah, in a nutshell, that's my introduction and I look forward to a lot of interaction with you here. Thank you very much. Perfect. Well, thank you everybody. I hope that gives you a sense of where our panelists are gonna be coming from today as we leave this session. So I'm just gonna give you a little bit of sense of what to expect today uh, for this now a little bit under an hour together. So what we're going to do is provide you with two different scenarios, case study scenarios, um, exploring two different types of quote unquote, edge technologies. Um, and in these circumstances, we're going to provide you with, one of our panelists has been assigned to be the pitcher, the person who's selling and pitching this for you all to consider as an investment. And the other one is the contrarian, someone who's going to present as um, Amira stated before, some of the demerits and maybe some of the considerations to not invest along that edge technology. And so after you hear both the pitch and the, con the counter pitch, um, we will open it up to all of you to, with both informations, both sides of the coin in your head, to place yourself along that spectrum of agree or disagree with whether or not to go ahead and invest in that technology, and then have a little brief discussion before moving on to the second scenario. And in order to do this, um, a little bit interactive, um, I have developed a, a mirror board is what we call it, so a collaborative tool where you will get the chance to review that scenario and using a sticky note, type in your name and then drag it along that spectrum of where you feel like you land. I will go over how to do this right before we end up using this tool um, between the different sessions. And if you can't use it, no problem. You can always plug in chug your uh, perspective inside the Zoom chat and I will make sure that it's captured on the board for everyone to see. Okay. That's a little bit about the layout of the session for today, this agree-disagree sort of debate where we hope to get your input and perspective as well. And I figured we might as well go ahead and get started with the first scenario. All right, I will kick us off. The scenario that we are provided here, um, this case study scenario, is as follows. Across the African continent, countries are chasing after their UNAIDS 95-95-95 goals. Some countries are already on target to meet them, and others are working to accelerate progress in the second and third 95 goals. Digital health organizations like MacroEyes and Palindrome Data are proposing the use of predictive machine learning models 
to streamline HIV programs and identify risk levels of individuals in the population that are likely to have an adverse event. For example, interruption in treatment um, or increased VL. Research studies have validated the efficacy of these machine learning models. HIV implementing organizations are considering implementing these models to improve retention in care and adherence in treatment. So the question will be whether we agree or disagree with an investment in this AI machine learning technology or this HIV implementing organizations work across the Sub-Saharan African continent. So we are going to move right to our pitcher, Amira, to speak to maybe the considerations you all can take on uh, investing in this technology. Thanks, Ariel. Um, hi again, everyone. So all over the globe right now, um, organizations, countries are applying innovations, technologies, not just machine learning, data science, um, AI, to overcome some challenges in the health system, whether it's overburdened healthcare workers um, and under-resourced healthcare systems that don't have enough specialists or healthcare workers to address this growing demand for healthcare. I believe that machine learning is a valid innovation uh, to evolve healthcare systems and something that countries should think about investing in. Um, it's certainly not without its fails, but what new innovation isn't? 10 years ago, EMR systems were not well received. Today, most low middle income countries and many other countries are prioritizing it in their digital health strategies. And they've also made progress in the enabling environments around policy, around governance and legislation um, and leadership, around strategy, around infrastructure, um, and are moving towards, progressively moving towards that interoperable architectures which all are useful and can facilitate and support um, and provide opportunities for machine learning to be used in the healthcare system. So I don't believe newness is a good argument for whether or not to invest in machine learning, but there may be some valid arguments that caution you or make you think about uh, how do you go about it or what are those aspects to think about when implementing machine learning or investing in it. One of the biggest debates around machine learning is data quality. And it's especially known that data quality is a challenge in low resource, setting, low resource settings and uh, developing countries. But at the same time, and, and the, argue, the classic argument around this is garbage in, garbage out. Yet at the same time, the same data um, that is being touted as insufficient for data science and machine learning is still being used to develop dashboards and monitor indicators for routine health and health planning. And so the more the data is being used, whether it's for stats or epidemiology or machine learning, the greater the incentive to start improving that data. Um, and, and, I, and I can tell you many organizations are already investing in data quality initiatives. If you're an organization or a funding, uh, or a funding partner, let us know in the chat if you're one of those organizations um, that are already investing in data quality initiatives across countries. And organizations that are working in the data science space, MacroEyes, IntraHealth, I recently read a very interesting case study from them, can tell you that um, the linear analysis that we do for these indicator monitoring and dashboards um, compared to machine learning have a lower impact. In comparison, the complex analysis offered by machine learning that provides forecasting and predicting is useful and more impactful in shifting healthcare systems from a reactive to a proactive healthcare system, which is what we want to do. We want less people to get sick. We want to be able to prevent adverse outcomes and reduce those burden on the healthcare system, reach those UHC and SDG goals as fast as, as possible. And so there's also enough of the data to go around besides the data quality. Uh, right now, so many different organizations are collecting data itself. 
there's no need to generate new data. So actually no cost in collecting data for data science or machine learning algorithms and models. There's, uh, there's enough there's enough methods within machine learning and data science to merge various different data sources from government data to public data to social impact NGO program data, which is so in-depth and contextual in that many more programs are now focusing on key populations and marginalized populations, which have often been underrepresented, underrepresented in the data. But as we start to progress to understand populations more and more, and with more programs focusing on these marginalized populations, we can close the gap on uh, data not being representative enough. And so with this heterogeneous data um, and data from all these various different sectors, the depth and the context that machine learning can offer is great and impactful. In fact, something that machine learning can do that we're not already doing with collecting all this amount of data in the M&E space, in the epidemiology space, is to tell you what is the minimum number of variables needed to describe a population or to monitor an outcome or a variable. So through something called feature engineering in machine learning, you're able to minimize that noise of all the data that is being collected and focus specifically on what data is important to you. And in a world where implementers and managers are inundated with dashboards, indicators, data, and the data use culture is not as mature as we want to, minimizing the data to highlight and extract what you what you only need, what you what is most necessary to you is a huge win. Um, and a direct reduction on burden on healthcare workers and quickly pointing out what is the fruitful direction for analysis to take? How do you direct your data use culture? So I do believe, yes, machine learning has its challenges, but it is maturing. Um, and, it, and, and one of the questions that come to mind then is, can it outperform a human decision or a human outcome? Probably not at this stage. Um, and, I, and I don't even know when it will ever reach the stage or if we even want it to reach the stage. Uh, Palindrome's take on machine learning models is that the intention is not to replace the human. We can never replace the tacit knowledge that a nurse or a community health worker has about the client that they're servicing. But the idea is to augment and increase efficiency. Um, thinking about how can we help a healthcare worker who has all these years of experience validate what they already know, or even help new healthcare workers um, feel confident in making and coming to a clinical decision as they build their experience around working with patients or working in that context, in that environment. And I'll give you an example about two weeks Amira, ago. Amira, we're gonna need to have you wrap up your point so we can go into the contrarian point here just in a moment. Okay, sure. Okay, cool. So the point is not to help them, uh, not to make a decision for them, but to help to come to that decision faster, especially when they're seeing about 15 to 20 patients per day um, in a facility setting. So you also come to ask questions about uh, the reliability of the model. If it can't outperform a human, how is it reliable to know whether this decision um, is, is trusted? And the evidence says it's pretty close. In Palindrome's model, it's able to predict interruption in treatment or adverse outcomes in three out of four cases or two out of three cases in some of our other models. And this accuracy and reliability is not just about the algorithm. There's a whole process that's not highlighted in the data science part that speaks to cleaning, wrangling, merging the data, and focuses on investing on that data quality and minimizing the effects of poor data quality when developing a model. And this helps you uncover other insights that you may have not found. So what we found useful is that even in low resource settings, machine learning models can be implemented and applied using um, by, by either in refining the enrollment criteria or the program analysis, looking at um, helping healthcare workers look at 
what is going to happen and what do they do about what is going to happen. So we've also learned some lessons around that implementation, while the technology is easy to get, the implementation is the hard part. Um, and it is possible to imp implement in both the paper and digital uh, e environments. And we're already doing this using a smart guideline approach where you're describing the kinds of steps and decision tree like processes that machine learning models do. And this does a few things. It unveils that black box around machine learning model. It makes it integrate into any digital system without having to roll out a new application. And it allows low resource settings and paper-based environments to still make use of these machine learning insights. So one thing that we talk about on the projects is the importance of user testing and workflow testing to ensure that that implementation is supported within that context of that environment. While technology is replicable, context changes across environments, context in terms of how things work, as well as the data. So continuously validating the model against context in terms of the workflow and in terms of the data are going to increase that outputs of machine learning and the benefits that it has in that setting. Some key lessons to wrap up is that um, to offset that riskiness of new approaches around machine learning, that buy-in and trust is an important part. And to do that, you need to show that quickly through quick proof of concepts, rapid fail-fast tests that can be proved uh, fairly easily and upfront early on. Data science expertise is not the same as statistical or epidemiological expertise, but collaboration between those three will enhance the contribution and reduce any blind spots between those three areas to give you quite a holistic insight uh, of your data. Interdisciplinary teams are essential and it, it, it bridges that gap of communicating technical stuff plainly so that everybody understands what is happening and also then works to unveiling that black box around machine learning. And then minimizing cost around machine learning and data science comes down to really using what is existing in the space. There's so much data already. Um, it's just about applying new ways of gathering those insights around it. Thanks, Ariel. I'll, I'll hand it back to you. All right, and now we're moving right along to a counterpoint, and we're going to pass it along to Merrick to counter the investment pitch uh, for AI and machine learning. All right, uh, we should not use machine learning uh, in our HIV work or probably international development work in general. Absolutely not. If I've learned one thing in 15 years of trying to make technologies work, it's simple, simple, simple. If you want a technology to actually have an impact on the ground in rural settings at scale, it has to be something that is really simple, really basic, and, and really resilient to the types of problems that arise in the context of the work that we do. We have to ask questions around what is actually that quality of data. We have to ask questions about like, what are the incentives that lead us to perceive the data that are probably better than it is? Why, why, why do we think we've achieved what we've achieved? I can tell you right now that when someone is identified in the field with HIV, they get referred to a facility. When they go to that facility, they receive another HIV test. They often then get referred to a third facility where they receive a third HIV test. I can also tell you right now from firsthand experience that most countries do not have the ability to identify that it's the same patient receiving those tests. Therefore, we don't even have a denominator of how many people have HIV. We have no idea how many people have HIV because we lack the ability to disaggregate our data to understand how many of those tests belong to individuals, how many of those tests are repeated. So the data is bad and we pretend it's not as bad as it is, still kind of useful, we have vague sense, but we don't have a specific enough sense to really be able to apply that data effectively. And this is why machine learning is particularly dangerous in this case. Since the data itself is poor and we can't really trace people through care, then when we start to build models that in themselves are often black boxes that start to turn out numbers, that creates a really convincing case for policymakers, decision makers, funders like USAID to then start to make big decisions based upon those numbers. And it creates cognitive biases like anchoring biases where we're like, oh, we actually know this, a, a model, an AI model, develop this, this number, this is what we should aim for. 
that will then override the experience of the practitioners, the frontline health workers and others who are like, ooh, that doesn't feel right at all. That doesn't match the experiences we have. And these cognitive biases then will pull us away from probably more natural, uh, simple strategies that the frontline workers themselves might have to, to do the work that they're doing and towards sort of large overarching blanket strategies uh, that push us to what what the the models, which probably are being fed with that junk in, junk out, as as Amira as Mira said, is one of the risks. Like that 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 leads us to uh, 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 strategies that aren't necessarily going to be as effective. And so. Uh, uh, basically, there are issues with workforce and keeping these models working. There are issues with regulations and privacy. There are issues across the board with all sorts of things, but it really comes down to the fact that we don't have good data. And AI, as amazing as it is, I play with Dolly, I play with uh, text-to-speech models, I play with all these sorts of like exciting new technologies. They're so cool, but they require really good data that is contextually appropriate for the environments they're from uh, uh, to, to work well. And we just don't have that. We need to focus on the basics get our basic data, data systems in place, use that data, but use that data in a way where the fail safe isn't five steps removed from the person collecting, collecting those data. All right, and with that, I will, I will stop. Hopefully I've convinced you uh, not, to, not to use ML. Okay, so now that we've heard both scenario, uh, the scenario and the pitch for and against this, I've placed in the chat there, um, in the Zoom chat, for those of you who are with a desktop computer, please go ahead and click on that. I will share my screen to review with you how you can go ahead and cast your vote. And if you can't do that um, on the mirror board itself, no problem. Please just drop it into the Zoom chat and I will place it for you. You can take one of these sticky notes for scenario one based upon um, the arguments made for and against investing in AI and machine learning for this specific use case of an HIV program in Sub-Saharan Africa. You can click on a sticky note um, when you're in this arrow mode, type in your name and then go ahead and drag and drop it on the spectrum. And again, if you have any trouble using this, please just go ahead and put your vote in the chat of where you want me to place you and I can place you myself on the board. I will go ahead and set the timer for about one minute to get those votes on the board and then we can open it up for discussion. Ooh, we've got some nice in the middle. We've got all the, I'm seeing a little bit of, um, maybe maybe due to the conference we are at, I am seeing a lot of folks moving towards the invest in the AI and machine learning, or maybe due to the <laughs> strong pitch for it. <laughs> Merrick's pitch, maybe not convincing people up for hesitating towards that investment. Middle ground, okay, I'll go ahead and add a middle grounder. Ooh, and some doing so well on the pitch that they can't even make a decision towards or against. All right, well, with the time up, you still have time to place your vote on there, but I'll, I'd love to go ahead and open it up to hear some conversation um, on where you and Brittany, yes, I'll go ahead and add yours too. Um, on where you all ended up on this board and maybe if you could say why or what's making, preventing you or making you hesitate towards putting it um, on agree or fully on disagree because there's a lot of people who ended up right in the middle. Anybody would like to share out their note, you may go ahead and raise your hand and I can call on you um, or you can type it in the chat as well. Ashley, go ahead. Yeah, hi, thanks. And thanks uh, for the pictures, everyone. Um, so from my side, I think being aware of the risks of the challenges and certainly things like the quality of the data are essential. Going ahead with just blindly and thinking technology solves all problems, that's, uh, I think we're way too down, far down the line to think that that's the approach. But it is using that as a gate to kind of like determine when it's appropriate or not. But I think, um, and uh, I'm a colleague of Amira, so I'll be totally uh, acknowledge my bias here. But uh, actually, the goal is 
um, as Apple describes it, it's uh, real complexity is when it becomes simple. So we do believe that despite under the hood being extremely complicated, like I've got no idea how my Apple phone works, but the goal is to be able to make it simple and actually to take the burden off healthcare workers because they can target the interventions and be more productive as a result. Thank you, Ashley. That is a great point. Anybody have another perspective? Yes, um, Kamindo. I don't know if you said, I said your name right, so feel free to reintroduce yourself. Correct, yeah. My name is, uh, am I audible? Yes. Oh, great, yeah. My name is Kirori Mindo, um, the digital development at uh, USAID in Kenya. And I, I you know, I, I tend to agree with, um, uh, uh, with a lot of the, the views here, and, and 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 one of the reasons why I was in the middle of um, um, strongly and middle agree is just because AI obviously has great benefits, but we, I think, we need to ground truth a lot of the results that come from AI and ML initiatives by going to the ground and checking whether the results actually do mirror. Um, what exactly is, you know, um, uh, the ground looks like. So, but I think it's a great, great um, um, tool. It, you know, it accelerates outcomes. We are able to get results in, in you know, in a much uh, faster and cheaper way, uh, but we still need to ground truth a uh, lot of the results there. Yeah, those basically are my views. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, is there anybody who wants to speak who maybe was on? Um, so if we look at where we landed, so far we've heard two votes here and we've heard from perspectives who landed somewhere along the spectrum, but still within the agree space. Is there anybody who would like to share their perspective who might've landed right in the middle or perhaps fully on the strongly disagree side or not fully? I see Matt and Amelia are just slightly over on that side. Go ahead, Matt. Sure. Wow, what an exciting prompt. You know, as the prompt reads, uh, it doesn't actually include, I think, a lot of the people that were being talked about with the like the people in the middle that are using or entering that data or trying to be make the you know human side contribution to the data collection. If the to be truthfully with the prompt, I kind of leaned more towards agree, which is if you cut out everything in the middle and you're just trying to look at data analytics around the, the clients of the system being served then you know, whether it's machine learning or a health worker up front or a hardware or software decision tool, like uh, you know, I do kind of believe that on principle, machine learning should help optimize and make that more efficient. But I think everything that we talked about yesterday was that if we just look at the prompt that way, we're like ignoring all of the complexities and the challenges of like how you know programs are really implemented, the people that use them, and the entire value chain of like that whole decision, getting the data collected, you know, entering it, analyzing it, you know, the human quality check on it. So my no vote is mostly strengthened by everything from yesterday and the lessons kind of learned or shared about it's all those other uh, elements um, that are assumed by the prompt. Um, that's maybe the greater wisdom. Uh, over. Thank you, Matt. All right. Um, so looking at all those perspectives, if you feel like you want to change your vote, feel free to drag it down across there. If you want to close out with any final words, Merrick and Amir, I'll give you a chance now before we move into our next scenario. No, I, I, uh, uh, we're, we're at an event about how to use technology for development that makes a lot of sense that most people are like, let's use technology for development. So, um, uh, but beware, <laughs> beware uh, of, the, of the hubris that comes with uh, uh, assuming that technology will solve the problem. Yeah, um, it seems like uh, even those who agreed still brought up great points to consider to qualify their agreement. So we take those to heart and we'll go ahead and um, then shift us to scenario number two. All right, so scenario two has us focusing on uh, blockchain specific specifically. So while we're giving it a name, country B has robust infrastructure and connectivity to support ICT implementations. Their leadership and governance structures are unstable and uncoordinated. Different parts of the government manage different commodities and supply chains, and the country is having a particularly difficult time effectively managing its medication supply chain and preventing leakage. 
a funder connects to the ministry with an idea to invest in blockchain technology to support supply chain for these high value medications. Shall we go with this investment, explore this investment at this time or not? And to hear about a little bit more about why we should, I'm going to pass it off to Joy uh, for the pitch. All right, thanks, Ariel. Um, so, you know, I think blockchain is really exciting for supply chain management. Um, you know, as made clear in country B, a product reaching, you know, an end user is really representative of a cumulative effort of many organizations and many stakeholders all working in content in con concert um, to you know to get that product to 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 its end user and one of the biggest challenges that's faced in supply chain is the lack of transparency in the supply chain as all these different actors work together to uh, to move products up and down the supply chain so if you think about it, a supply chain has like two types of flows. One is the physical flow, as in the movement of goods from one point to another. And the other is the information flow, which is, you know, the flow of information about that movement of goods that allows for coordination um, between, you know, throughout the supply chain in order um, to, to facilitate that movement of goods. And it's very difficult to keep track of both the movement and the information about that movement. Um, and as a result, you know, there's huge room for human error and fraud, um, whether it's through, you know, um, counterfeit medicines or theft and leakage and those kinds of things. These are the things that we're dealing with whenever we're, um, we're, we're working in a supply chain that has high value medications. Um, and this is where blockchain can be really exciting. Um, as we all know, a shared blockchain is, uh, you know, can be a trusted and tamper-proof audit trail um, for the flow of information and inventory within a supply chain. Um, a blockchain allows all the stakeholders, whether you're distributors to health workers and everyone in between, to record and monitor the movement of the products along the supply chain, um, and in that way ensures the availability of sufficient levels uh, levels of products. Um, and because the ledger is fully distributed across the network, it's difficult to corrupt. So if you make a change in the ledger, um, you have to log the change across every node in the entire network simultaneously. And if it's not done, the network will recognize that that record doesn't match the rest of the records and will flag the transaction as corrupt. Um, and so this makes it easy for organizations to trace the history of a product right from its point of origin to where it eventually ends up. Um, every time the product change ha changes hands, a transaction will be documented securely, a permanent record is created, and, um, and you know, it's immutable and unable to be changed. Which, which lends to the transparency of, um, of the blockchain. It's also not possible to erase the records, right? Um, so someone who is trying to be fraudulent or in situations where um, they're trying to introduce counterfeit medicines, um, it is easy, you know, there is a, there is a built-in accountability um, because each step in the supply chain is logged securely. So you can track products right from their source um, to, to, their, um, to their end point. Um, so really, I just feel that, you know, blockchain can really improve supply chains um, by enabling faster, more cost efficient delivery of products, enhancing their, their traceability and improving coordination between all the different partners in, in the supply chain. Um, and I think that with, you know, this powerful technology, um, par parties that are collaborating in the supply chain um, will really be able to work together to reduce um, the risk of fraud and um, and leakage and all the other problems we see in high value medication um, supply chains um, in order and and end up with comprehensive records that trace products from from the start to their very end. So um, I will stop there, but I hope I've convinced you to uh, to to invest in blockchain. Thanks. All right. Well, thank you, Joy. So now let's hear an opposing uh, perspective and point from. Uh, try more. Thank you very much, Joy. Uh, These are nice points uh, to take. 
And indeed, um, much as blockchain is quite important and um, quite the uh, intervention of the time, I would like to just take you back a bit, uh, especially when it comes to investing in blockchain in uh, country B in Africa. Um, the main challenge is its strength. Uh, when you talk about transparency, when you talk about uh, distributed ledger, etc., you are actually giving the power to the masses and um, uh, by opposing, I think the most governments in Africa or least developed countries, power is actually centralized. We are talking of a distributed system um, given to a centralized, you know, juxtaposed to a centralized um, uh, system. And uh, to an extent that will not actually work. Uh, at the end of the day, people revert to their normal uh, working ways. Um, you also made point that uh, decisions will be taken by many people because you're having a distributed ledger. And once the record is changed, it's changed across uh, for everyone. But uh, in these governments that we are talking about, where country B is, most decisions are supposed to be taken by the authorities. So that is a big, big, big um, uh, challenge that we have here. Let me talk about counterfeit medicines. Um, you know, counterfeit medicines are actually not made in least developing countries or developing countries. They are made in the first world. And when they come here, they represent the big farmer. And these are people who have got lots of money and they can actually counterfund any efforts to implement blockchain in countries such as um, where I'm coming from. So a, there'll be a big challenge unless and otherwise if it becomes a culture of the people, a culture of openness, um, which is the tenets of blockchain anywhere. So if it is not part of the culture, it will be very difficult, uh, close to impossible to actually implement. Um, let me also talk about um, other challenges which you find uh, in Africa. This will be my last you know, a point, sort of oppose what you're trying to uh, make us do here. Uh, look at um, the infrastructure that we have. Of course, this is a rich country, but um, most of Africa, Southern Africa to be specific, are affected by things like electricity. Digital health and electricity, they actually go hand in the hand in the glove. And we have got very little and poor investment in uh, alternative or green energy sources like, such as solar. So when you have power blackouts like we have currently even down south in South Africa, it means the technology won't work. And everyone can't actually get hold of the technology and all operations will actually come to a halt. So for now, I would say, hmm, keep it there and come uh, bit by bit until everyone really understands is taken into this idea, then we can say, let's invest. I will say, last point like Merrick, technology has to be very simple. Technology has to actually make use of what is there. Blockchain for now is quite too complicated to the environment that we come from. Thank you very much. All right, well, that was a passionate argument uh, from Trimore right over there. So let's see where people fall on the spectrum again. I'm gonna share the, uh, in the chat. Um, you'll see a mirror board link if you can access it to uh, the second scenario's voting screen. It'll look very similar to the first, um, but this time it's about the scenario two blockchain. I'm sharing it on my board here. Feel free to go ahead and add a sticky note. Um, from right below uh, with your perspective on where you might land on this spectrum. I'll go ahead and um, also start a timer to give us some time frame. And here we go. Again, if you need support on getting your votes on this mural board, please let me know. And you can just place your, uh, your vote in the chat. Okay, so on the right side, we see strongly agree for exploring investment in this blockchain technology. On the left, we see strongly disagree from exploring this investment in 
this technology, despite, I would say, a very uh, a strong argument um, sort of against. So, uh, oh, okay, so we've got um, a couple people making some votes, but adding some specifics as to why their vote might be for or against for different ideas. But we see quite a bit of people who are still feeling that it's a strong um, investment strategy for this country, despite some of the argument that um, we, we had added to the board. Um, and yes, Brittany, I will go ahead and add your perspective as well. Um, would anybody like to raise their hands or unmute and express why they placed themselves on the board where they did? Yes, go ahead, Ashley. Yeah, so here I put myself dead in the middle. So unlike on our initial board, actually, I don't have much experience here. And so um, me putting myself in the middle there is to say I would need to, if it was my decision, conduct more engagement, more kind of like uh, investigating to know really, well, what is the best thing here? In other words, technology isn't just always a yes, um, but at the same time should be open mind, I believe, and then to evaluate further. All right. Great. Not to hear from the, not that I am looking to hear from the exact same people, but here we go again. Um, I think we have Kirori, you're up next. Thank you, Ariel. I think I will test the river with both feet here, if <laughs> if I was to use that <laughs> that example. But but I mean I mean the current disposition is not working. It's simply not working. The uh, medication supply is not getting to the people who need them. You know, there's a lot of leakage, especially with um, um, with all the commodities. The the current status quo is not simply not working, then I think this begs the need to actually uh, explore, um, uh, if, if I can call it, um, uh, just try out and see how whether the blockchain technology will solve the problem and, and perhaps bring a, a little bit more uh, transparency um, um, to, the, to the healthcare, and, and and speaking from a country that has actually suffered a lot in terms of a very poor medical supply, I think it's time to give it a new, a new give it a new shot. Okay, all right, that was a persuasive argument as well as to why it might be worth at least exploring this investment moving forward. Um, Again, and not to imitate the same structure that we did last time, but I am curious, Matt, since you put yourself as being for one portion of blockchain, but maybe not the other, I'm curious if you might well, want to just explain your your perspective here. Sure, I cheated. Um, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. This is why it's an open uh, forum with sticky notes. You can make it the board whatever you want. From what we learned about blockchain technologies, technologies, uh, I was firmly in the disagree camp around, I think, what the prompt states around, um, it's pretty codependent on a strong governance structure or the ability to capacity to manage that. And what's available on the current marketplace today is still really quite centralized and dependent on like a lot yeah. of, you know, central models for managing uh, the information systems they're designed to support. But my like slightly, very slightly optimistic view is that true distributed ledger technologies uh, which might even include the analog paper registers and notebooks that moto couriers are already carrying around in country B, like our how supply chain systems are functioning. And the more that they could just be like embraced or harmonized and like, you know, deduplicated or cross-referenced. Um, and I think that like some elements of trying to like manage dispersed and fragmented data systems is like in the spirit of what like true distributed ledger things are really about. And maybe that is the future for country B if like centralized governance systems will be a persistent challenge. So I'm still like philosophically optimistic about the approach and theory behind that. But in terms of like technology on the marketplace, uh, it's pretty firmly not appropriate, I would say, over. It's a strong point, Matt, about um, the distinction between where you placed your, your votes. And to me, it sounds like it was a vote almost for interoperability in the center, <laughs> but on the other side, it was to maybe not so much specifically for blockchain, but some of the benefits of which certain aspects of it could bring towards that um, com communication and coordination piece. Um, all right, and I know that we have about five minutes left here. So I'm going to ask if, um, let's say, 
anybody else in the room has any final thoughts or final words about blockchain or um, some of the dialogue going on in your head about for or against for this specific scenario? All right. Um, so with that, I think we'll close out then. Let's so, see if, oh yeah, go ahead, I'll, Merrick. Do you I'll have some perspectives? Yeah. yeah so just like, I think with any of these technologies, right, the potential always comes down to the thoughtfulness and understanding that the implementers put into the work. I think you could probably take any feature technology. And if you have people that are really passionate and really trying to work with uh, uh, the, uh, within and directly with the local context, you probably can derive value from it. And on the flip side, technologies that like 100% could provide value can go horribly, horribly wrong if we don't, as an implementation community, put that that tender, loving care into our implementation. And so there's just a call to really understand the enabling environment that you're working in, really work don't just work for local partners or don't try to meet the USA donor goals. Like really try to make the, make the, make the technologies work, try to learn new mistakes or make new mistakes, try to try to learn new lessons. And when you do try to share those out and, uh, and uh, you know, that's the strength of our community is, is we have the, the sort of uh, uh, inclinations from the tech sector to try to learn uh, and, and to grow. And like, we need, we need to do that. Uh, I continue to do that as a, as a community. So just uh, as we explore these new technologies, let's let's try to do it well. Great. And Trimer, would you like to add uh, some closing words before we end the session today? True, true. Thank you very much, Ariel. Um, so my point would be, I think as much as we feel for those people that are not getting medication when they're supposed to get it, we really need to look at the actual problems, why they're not getting that medication before we look at the technology to address the problem. My work with uh, Tech Change, I think in the previous months where we were going through digital health, you know, uh, capacity building, taught me that we really have got to do a problem analysis, fish diagram, try to find the root cause of the problem before we can then mess the technology to solve the problem. Thank you very much. You know how to make me so happy, Trimer, when you quote our <laughs> some of the, the coursework that we have. So that's it's wonderful to hear. And yes, that's a very valid yeah. point before coming up with a solution. Um, yes. And then maybe let's hear from Joy too. Before, we have a couple more minutes. Go ahead. Yeah, sorry, I'll be fast. Um, yeah, not to belabor the point, but um, I totally agree with Merrick and Trimer. And I actually was very convinced with by Trimer's counterpitch. I expected more people. <laughs> <laughs> to be like, forget blockchain. I, you know, I, I think that his counterpart made it clear that it's not necessarily about the technology, but it's about where you're trying to uh, implement the technology and whether it makes sense for that context. Um, and I think that's just something we really need to keep in mind as we do this, this work. There's a lot of exciting things out there, but like exciting doesn't mean it's going to solve your problem in that specific context. And, um, you know, it shouldn't be just about the technology. Sometimes, a problem can be solved by technology, but it could be solved better doing something that is not technology related. And so we just need to think about like when it makes the most sense to use the new exciting innovations. Um, but thanks so much for giving us a chance to have this conversation. Wonderful. Um, and Amira, would you like to say any closing words before we um, end our session today? Uh, I think my colleagues have covered it all. Definitely, uh, I mean, there's so much we can draw from the from the course, like match up the the problems with the solution. Technology is not a silver bullet, but I think we we've, we've covered it across the section. Great, thank you well, everyone for your participation. Uh, thank you again for joining us today. We hope we gave you just the right amount a dose of, of critical lens to approach some of these sessions today, but also an excitement for these innovations if you think through the proper processes and considerations that um, our panelists laid out for you today. So thank you again for joining our session and I hope you have a great rest of your days at FDDF. Bye everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.